Oh, good morning. Thank you to just everybody real quick for taking the time to do this this morning. I really appreciate everybody's work on this film. So uh, just being able to ask one of you a question to start this out, setting the tone for that, it's really tough to do just because I was, much like Robert was saying in the beginning, I was absolutely floored by this movie. It was an incredibly impressive film. And this is just something that I you don't see films like this. And this is an incredibly important film. But one of the things that I was struck with right away, um, Marcelo, it was the, uh, the simplicity and beauty of the score in this. I think it's deceptive um, with how small it is at times and just how subtle. Could you talk a little bit about um, just the process of the themes of this film? Yes, absolutely. Hi. Um, well, Antoine wanted us to, to focus, um, and we, we talked a lot about focusing both on the large and the small, both within the sound of the film where you have smaller chamber pieces with just a little bit of voice and percussion to very large orchestral and choir things. Um, one of the sort of the code name for the film for a, for a lot of us was sacred motivation. So uh, the spiritual part of this film was integral. And of course, that's something music can do very well. The voices were meant to convey the spirituality of both um, uh, the Peter's ancestral uh, sort of spiritual beliefs uh, combined with his Christian beliefs. So we kind of go back and forth with the music. And from that very first shot, that beautiful, beautiful shot of the forest that goes into the plantation, the goal of the music was to set the stone for this mysterious place where nature is integral to, to the story and to everything that is happening but also with spirituality and also not shying away from the darkness. So Antoine did not want us to ever make this pretty or sort of sugarcoat what was going on there. So that sort of somber, but yet very beautiful opening uh, in the photography, but also in the music, I feel like it's, it, it, it's, it's what sets up our, our tone for, for the movie, musically speaking, and visually, I would say too. All right, thank you for that. I am Mia Barrington with blackfilm.com. My question is for Ms. Francine. I was curious to know what were uh, some of the biggest challenges for you with creating this costume design and did uh, shooting in black and white, how did that affect your process, if any? Well, I think uh, one of the challenges uh, that I was facing as a costume designer was some of the, a lot of the cast members were not cast yet. So it was about trying to uh, really create the, uh, the costumes with, with a uh, character, not knowing who that actor was going to be. So we had to move ahead and just uh, really put a lot of things into work. And, and when that person was cast to try and uh, just fit it to them as uh when the uh, the person was cast, really. So, and I think a lot of the challenge was, and and really speaking with Antoine, and conferring with uh, with Bob and and also Naomi, it was it was a really group effort in order to attain the realism of that Antoine wanted to reach. He didn't want this to be uh, something that is a um, some type of uh, romantic thing going on about what's uh, the enslaved people or what slavery was or any of this, but he wanted it to be realistic. And it was a, I think, very challenging in trying to get the aging just right, the over dying and everything into just to make sure that the, the fabrics, the clothing, everything was working properly in order to uh, just really have every all of it uh i would say blending in with bob's wonderful photography and and naomi sets and and everything else and even with the sound with with ed's wonderful sound mixing so it was all a group effort and the the makeup the hair and, and i had such wonderful people in the costume department that were um the age or dyer who was incredible, uh, Darren Mazzari and, and Harlan Glenn, who was just an amazing uh, military historical uh, technical advisor. So it was, um, 
I think that aspect of it was really kind of interesting. It was challenging, but it was really rewarding. Hello, um, my name is Patrick Gibbs from Slug Magazine at Salt Lake Underground. Um, Robert, you have been uh, one of the gods of cinematography to me ever since The Horse Whisperer. Um, so it's a, a pleasure to be talking to you. Shooting this film in black and white was so clearly the right approach on so many levels including giving the film a more visual connection to the original photograph of Peter. But I was curious if you could talk a little bit about the decision to go near black and white and <laughs> what, what motivated that. Well, we started thinking it would be in color. And Antoine, myself, and almost virtually everyone felt that black and white would be a better alternative. But uh, studio was not along with that process completely at that initial start. And we just, I think everyone here felt that the black and white added exactly what you just said, an element that attached itself to a time period better than, at least I felt better than when we, if we had put it in color. And Antoine was very pivotal in making that choice and that decision to alter um, the moments of color that you briefly see, whether it be the greens of a grass or you know the red of a flag, or et cetera, et cetera. And we try to use that as tones. And um, that's primarily what the reason we did it is because it just felt like it was the best way to approach the story very cleanly. Thank you. Michael? Uh, hello, Michael Bergeron with Screen Reflections. Um, so I have a question and uh, just anybody who would like to chime in, but I guess specifically the uh, VFX supervisor, Mr. Legato, how did you shoot the alligator sequence? What, what, what was involved with that? Uh, the alligator sequence was, uh, what was mostly involved is shooting uh, basically every technique that we had one was shooting above water with a legacy created alligator that was manipulated, uh, you know, it was sort of puppeteered, but that's for very quick little moments, the tail splashing, uh, you see a little bit of the head. Then we, the, probably the most clever thing we did is we built a um, LED wall with a giant, what amounts to a giant aquarium in front of it. So the background or the, or the swamp background uh, was was uh, projected on this LED wall. It's basically, if you picture a, an aquarium in front of a television set, that's ultimately what we did. The uh, And then it allowed uh, for filtered water for Will to be able to open his eyes cleanly and easily and not get hurt and be able to wrestle with the legacy alligator that was now much smaller, more, more of the head uh, uh, puppeteering where he can stab it and we could have blood come out of it and things like that. And then occasionally, just so you didn't feel like it was so limited, to those types of, of tight shots. We had like two or three key um, uh, computer generated shots where we used the same background that we used as the background behind Will. Uh, so it could intercut cleanly with it. And we had a, a computer generated uh, uh, Will that was based on his performance in terms of what he was doing to allow you to see a little bit wider shot. So the sum total of all the shots from the real uh, uh, shots that we did in the swamp to the LED wall to um, uh, full CG shots were all mixed together as cleanly as I could possibly do it. So it was it was kind of a quick in, quick out, and um, you didn't really get to study any one technique for very long before it starts to, you know, show its limitations. So that, that was pretty much how we did it. And, you know, the hard part was you know, in this kind of film, because it's such a beautifully made film, you don't want to do anything that is artificial at all, or so you have to try to go for that extra bit of realism at every moment. And it was really key to have Will actually perform 
most of the his close up work uh, instead of doing it as a CG thing or as a stunt double or anything else like that. So went to great pains to make it easy for him to be able to perform it and be able to intercut. And Conrad did a nice job of piecing all these pieces together that we uh, created. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Hello, I'm Boris Coltier, Mulderville. Marcelo, what must be for you a great collaboration between a director and a composer? I, be, I, I think that for me, a great collaboration is where you feel that there's a lot of trust and there's a, a very safe space to to try things, you know, and to uh, uh, Antoine is extremely open uh, to musical ideas. He reacts emotionally. Uh, always, it's always about the emotion. Whatever concepts we discussed before, everything kind of goes to the background once he hears something, and and it's whether he is getting that hit of emotion that he's looking for. Uh, and and we've been working for quite some time now. This is our uh, I counted as our sixth project together. We had a very very good. Uh, shorthand and mostly Antoine really is, is a director that understands respects and loves the power of music uh in his films and music period Antoine a lot of times randomly uh, he will text me a piece of music that he likes whether we're working on something or not so that's another way that he communicates but things that are very different from what we're ultimately going to do but he sort of uh, communicates with me through through sometimes pieces of uh, old classical pieces or or movies that he likes but mostly it's a very safe and uh, and creative space and and I have to say that uh, Conrad uh, was also an integral part of this I feel like it was kind of a three-way thing when we were looking at music it was always the three of us together and and uh, and it's sort of the ideal three-way uh, collaboration for music for me thank you My name is uh, Dan Skipown from disappointmentmedia.com. Um, I want to know how, whoever wants to answer this, this is fine, is how did you get the look of the, um, the costumes and the splashes of color where it comes as far as the cinematography goes? How did you get that all to match up to where it looks seamless in the overall product of the film. Rob, you should join this one. Okay. Uh, uh, well, a part of it, what we did um, uh, when we were coming up with the look for the film is that we would take, uh, uh, instead of going full black and white, we would turn into black and white first, adjust the different colors, red, green, and blue contributions to that black and white. Like if you had a red shirt on, and you were to change the the, um, the the contribution of that particular color layer, you could adjust its gray value to anything that you want. You're able to kind of very fine tune match it and then mix back, this was Bob's idea when we first were coming up with, should it be black or white or color, is to mix back a little bit of the color back in and then on top of there, if we want to add a little red or a little green or a little from the foliage, we could do that. But uh, so what we had is complete control as if it was all black and white, we could change any costume or any shade to the whatever gray value seemed to make the most sense or look the most um, pleasing and or match and then mix back color to that. So we're able to, to kind of creatively create this palette that Bob would sit in with Daly's colorist, uh, uh, Benny, um, and every day make these subtle artistic adjustments that now we should add a little more green, now we should add a little more blue, maybe we should make the skies go dark. So that mixed with the costumes and the art direction, we're able to uh, you know, very finely uh, control it for artistic reasons. Uh, 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 you know, above everything else. So Bob would sit with uh, the colorist every day and make these very subtle adjustments based on the drama that he and Antoine had worked out. What was important? What do we need to see? And uh, it was it was a it was a great it was a fun collaboration. It was fun, very fun to do it and come up with something because the look was so wonderful for the film that we were very excited every day we'd come out of dailies and we would and we would find something that we really liked that, that really, really played the drama very well. I agree with that. 
Thank you. Um, Francine here for costumes. I think uh, it's a, I agree with, uh, with Rob and because my collaboration with, uh, with Bob Richardson and Antoine and also with Naomi, it was um, every, I think every day or at least once a week or whatever, pretty much every day is to find out what these colors are going to do on screen, what the, how much uh, over dyeing, or if it has to be dyed at all or aging. And like I said before, how all of that blends in and just makes it uh, uh, appear to be seamless. So I think with uh, Bob's wonderful photography and, and with Naomi's sets and, and all of that, really a collaboration of it and also ultimately with with Antoine's vision of what that is and what that could be and the sense of as as Peter is running and all of the the um the way that he is going through a lot of the terrain and a lot of the 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 sense of what he is encountering along the way all of that has has to be really reviewed on how does that work and how does that translate with the costumes and what happens with them along the way. So it's, um, I, I really feel by uh, viewing the film, it really did have a, it made it work. And a lot of that is because of collaborating with all of the department heads and, and people who really know their, their, their profession and just making it all work together. Because I think we all felt that it was a story. It's a story that has, that was really had to be told and wanted it to be told realistically. And um, that is one of the major things too. Um, I'd also like to add something to this. Um, the, the choice of the, the way color was used here um, that, that, that um, Bob and Rob have just been discussing, the, that there's a kind of a distancing that happens with black and white that's also, that also creates intimacy. So there's kind of this um, um, contradiction in terms that works very beautifully to allow you to both receive the movie and also kind of look at it as a time out of time experience. I also want to say that Francine and Cindy Legeness, the decorator and to the greatest extent, and then to a little bit myself, everybody did a, a lot of research, Antoine as well, and I'm sure Bob and Rob and everybody, but everybody did a huge amount of research so that we all um, had a pretty good visual understanding, at least of what this world was, enough of what this world was in order to try to recreate it. Also the landscapes that we, that we that we use, the place that we chose to film the movie, um, the landscapes are magnificent. And Antoine had said that he wanted the movie to be both beautiful and brutal. And the landscapes, you know, as we explored them, scouting for locations, they 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 speak eloquently to 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 us. Um, and I I think that you know the land had a little bit to say to us as well about what may have happened in the past, even our experience of how rugged it was to, to be living and working there. But um, so the combination of, of the historical research, the distancing, the poetic distancing, the you know, listening to the land, all of these things I think contributed to the unity of the, the, end, um, the end result. And of course, you know, Antoine's driving vision I'm Fernando uh, Fernandez for uh, Fern TV. Uh, this uh, question is for uh, Cindy, uh, the set decorator. Uh, what was it like to, you know, um, uh, do you for your role to be in sort of this like historical piece? And what was uh, most inspiring doing um, your role for the for the film? Um, it was. For me, it was pretty exciting to do a lot of, to do the research, to study photographs, <clears throat> excuse me, that were taken at the time and to actually work in places where a lot of this history had taken place. Um, it's, 
you know, everything about it was pretty exciting as far as, far as being in Louisiana near these battlefields in some of these plantation areas where a lot of this actually historically would have taken place. So there was a, you know, a, a great sense of uh, connection with a lot of this. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Samuel Leggett with uh, JVS Media Productions. This is a question in relation to sound. Um, the swamp, the atmosphere, it kind of comes alive uh, very seamlessly. Um, and I wanted you guys to kind of talk towards that because it kind of feels like as as Peter or Will is going through the swamp, like you hear all the beautiful and yet deadly things all around him, whether it's like the trees, whether it's something creeping through the swamp, whether even in the water, like sound design felt very fluid and felt very natural. But what were some of the difficulties between that? Like, I mean, whether it's weather conditions, whether it's being in the water, you know, whether it's wind, I was curious y'all, you know, take on how difficult that process was because it, it, it becomes in and of itself, the swamp becomes a character in and of itself, the way you guys kind of transform it. But I, I can imagine it was also very difficult as well, so. Uh, well, I guess I can start this one off. Um, uh, I handled a lot of the, uh, the sound effects um, in the editorial and mixing uh, side of the sound. And, you know, um, it was very challenging for Ed Novick, our production sound mixer, just to capture clean dialogue. Um, but when the tracks came to us, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, atmosphere um, that was really usable given, you know, his period and there were a lot of generators and stuff like that. And, and you know, Ed's primary uh, goal is to capture the dialogue as clean as possible. And so it was really a large blank slate uh, blank canvas for us to uh, to tackle. Um, you know, of course, uh, Antoine was looking to you know um, uh, uh, make the swamp uh, uh, almost a, an extension of the labor camps in that it's you know a very dangerous place. You know, death is around every corner, um, but it's also like some of the, uh, our visual crafts have mentioned that it was also a very beautiful place. Um, so early on, you know, we we pulled a lot of sounds uh, even before we saw a picture to send to Conrad in the cutting room uh, that would evoke certain emotions that we felt would, you know, um, help uh, the swamp come alive. Uh, uh, tension, uh, sounds that are dangerous, sounds that are mysterious. Uh, we, you know, we tried to be respectful to the geographical location, but we also didn't let that hinder us as far as, you know, whether the insects were, you know, accurate to that location. If it, if it gave it that edge we were looking for, it was fair game, even if it was a slight bit more, you know, tropical in nature or something like that. So uh, it, it story first, drama first, uh, emotion first, because that's how Antoine tends to react to those situations. Um, and, you know, we just tried to make it a, you know, a nice, uh, dense, lush place um that just helped drive the story uh so you know we kept it uh thick and large when we needed to but we also would scale it back when appropriate um uh, i don't know if anybody else has anything they want to add to that so we have several i'll, add, I'll add a little bit to it um our foley team had quite a bit to do since it was such a a large blank canvas just to get the the actors movement through the swamp uh, and going from all those different surfaces, even in within the same shot, we had quite a bit of work to do uh, to make it feel real, that gritty, unflinching uh, realism that Antoine wants. He wants it, uh, he doesn't want to be taken out of the story. He wants to let the emotion take over. So we we were tasked with making it feel as real as possible. Thank you. Hi, uh, Chris Maynard with Following Films. I had a question for Conrad, or actually start with just a quick statement. I don't know if you saw my seven-year-old son walked in here a few minutes ago. Um, and it's, it's not often that there's someone that I'm talking to makes me look cool in his eyes, 
But the fact that it was you, I had to, he came in and had to point it out because he's obsessed with Titanic and watches it probably yeah. once a week. And so anybody that's ever touched that movie, when I get a chance to talk to them, it's just something he comes in and has to see them. So thank you for making me look cool well, to my uh, seven-year-old. Rob so, Legato is with us and he certainly had a hand yep, in that. That, that he did. Yeah. Um, and so, but the question I had for this is all the craft side of this film, it's very bold. But, you know, it just said people have talked a lot about the black and white, the visual sense of this, but the sound design of this thing, as well as the pacing of this film and the way it's put together, but it's all invisible. Um, and if you were, if it was drawing attention to itself, I don't think it would work. The average viewer might not necessarily know why something is unique looking, but they'll be pulled in by it. And I think that the pacing of this film is something that's really important because it's something that it could feel like a slog. This movie could feel like homework. It's something that could really just beat you up too much. And uh -huh. I feel like you'd really balance that well where it has the emotional impact, but it never overstays its welcome. And it's a film that absolutely does show restraint at times for as bold as it is. And I'm wondering well, if you could just talk a little bit about, about the uh, putting, keeping the um, flow of this movie, the, I guess, propulsion of this. Uh, well, thank you for the compliments. I appreciate it. Um, I'm pretty proud of the work uh, that all of us have done. Um, for me, I was spared the uh, the physical issues that uh, production, of course, experienced between you know the environments, hurricane, uh, COVID, all kinds of things exacerbating the the, the process. But um, so editorially, uh, in spite of the, the difficult nature of the film, it uh, was a pleasure for me as an editor, particularly the second act, which uh, there's basically an absence of dialogue. So uh, I had a lot of wonderful images to choose from, and it's very subjective, you know, how to structure it. And that, honestly, that area was probably the most difficult to, to balance and structure. Um, how long do I stay with uh, uh, Peter's wife? How long do I stay with Peter? How long do I stay with Fassel? There's these three different ingredients swirling around and trying to figure out that balance and how long we can stay in any scene was uh, particularly challenging. Um, but it was it was great fun. Uh, it it uh, as uh, Dave had mentioned, a lot of it was shot essentially MOS because Ed Novick, our production sound mixer, could not possibly record the detail that is required to give it life. And uh, so it was very freeing for me. It's not driven by dialogue in a lot of instances. Uh, there's no roadmap. Uh, it's more documentary-like and, and to a degree. But um, uh, my sound team uh, elevated my work tremendously. Uh, the detail and uh, character of environments, and as as uh, as uh, was mentioned, the foley, which is kind of a mundane to most folks uh, ingredient, but in this film, really essential uh, to give it uh, to to siphon off some of the you know what could be considered tedium of you know, running through a swamp. So there's all these uh, distinguishing ingredients. But uh, interestingly, the battle at the end of the film was probably the easiest for me to put together. And I was incredibly impressed by the material when I received it. I just couldn't believe what uh, everyone in production had achieved in, in a very short period of time. But the detail of all those ingredients sonically are, are so important to the film. Uh, I have to give everyone in the sound department particularly a lot of credit. Uh, hey, thank you. Thank you. Um, Bob, uh, I was wondering, you spoke at the beginning, you talked about crying when you saw this uh, and it, I cried 
and in your variety interview, you talked about some, some reluctance to join the project, whether you were right for it, stepping into it as, as, as a white uh, cinematographer into telling this story. Um, as we've just kind of touched on, you know, for me, this was, this is a movie that is a heavy subject matter, but it's also a crucial one. I wish everyone would see this film right now because it's, there's so much national debate on the subject of whether we talk about this era and stuff. What kind of responsibilities did you feel going into telling this story? And what, so what were some of the emotional challenges and what were some of the biggest technical challenges in telling that story? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I definitely had, uh, I definitely questioned as a white cinematographer, Caucasian cinematographer, to tackle a subject about that included slavery. I don't think this is particularly, I wouldn't say this is a film about slavery. I think it's also a very action oriented film uh, in, in somewhat, somewhat akin to Apocalypto or others. As I watched it today, first time, as I said, I had a full score. And the first time I'd seen it, like, I mean, I've seen it many, many, many times, but this was the first time with everything. And it did, it, it took me down a number of times. It took me down actually in the first scene with the family, with, with them just sitting and looking at each other and talking. Peter talked about God, love, family, et cetera. And it took me down later a number of times. Um, it was complicated initially to think, can you, can, should you be the person to tell a story? Or should someone else make this film as a cinematographer? I mean, at a certain point, talking to Antoine, I decided I wasn't, I wasn't afraid and I should tackle it. And uh, the technical issues you're asking were phenomenal. Uh, to shoot in a swamp, many people suggested initially it's built on stage and things like that, but you never had the variety that we all found. And uh, <clears throat> as I, I have to be very honest, but as I watched the movie today, I was, I was just blown away. I mean, I love everyone's work in it. It's like, I did, it just, it's haunting. The music's haunting. Everything's haunting. The sound design. There are moments when Antoine lets something play, like in full length. It just, and only this, the sound of words, almost virtually nothing. And then it be heightened. And it just took me. I was constantly like, my hand was on top of my leg. I was like squeezing my leg. And also squeezing uh, the woman I was with, like breaking her hand. I, she constantly had to pull a hand away. It's like, fuck this, man. This is a good fucking movie. And I was right next to Antoine. I turned towards him and I said, Antoine, man, this is so fucking good. I haven't seen it. It's like I've seen it so many times, but I've never seen it mixed. And the mix is must say. And also, I want to throw something out to Rob. Rob wasn't just VFX, Rob was also second unit. And he's highly, highly important in terms of the respect to what the film looks like, not only from um, a visual effects point of view, but from color point of view. He was always involved in creating that lookup table that we utilized. And he also directed numerous shots. You would, I mean, they vastly improved the work I did. I mean, Rob is, Rob is truly brilliant. And thank you, Rob. Peace, Bob, thank you for that. That's, uh... I'm kind of moved just by hearing that. That's uh, wonderful. I mean, my my job, which I find rather daunting, is to match uh, or try to match uh, uh, Bob and Antoine at their peak of their careers and do something that doesn't let them down in terms of it feels like they shot that portion of the movie that those intentions were those were their intentions, and that's the you know super challenge of of of, of doing a film with you know, to not to just return the compliment but of somebody as talented as Bob, is he sets the look and tone. Anton sets the look and tone of what the action is, and then you try to pick up the pieces and 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 deliver in kind. You know, something that, uh, if nothing else, not be disappointed in, even if it doesn't necessarily improve or would be better or or uh, th than what they would have done. Just to do it 
sort of at that level where maybe the audience doesn't notice that there was a different person you know, behind the camera or whatever. So, I mean, it's a, it's a high compliment indeed if no one noticed that I did anything and it felt like some of Bob's spectacular work and Antoine's spectacular directing on the, on the film. If, if, there's a, if I might be able to add to a little bit, I, I found the, the, the whole story extremely moving and also sad for me in that it should have been a triumph, just the end of slavery, but it was the beginning of the next hundred years or two hundred years of, of um, something that we're still going through, and so I can never be totally like, oh, we'll make a heroic moment that is an heroic moment, because it's just the beginning of the next phase of of of, of you know how terrible people can be to other human beings. So every time we shot, there was always an element of sadness that. It wasn't a total victory. The, 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 just the emancipation is not a total victory. It is just the beginning of the journey. And uh, I found that particularly moving and, and, and difficult to, to um, shoot as, a, as also as a, as a Caucasian you know, cinematographer or second unit director. It was, it was like the, just the beginning. This is not the end of that. It's the beginning of the next phase of that. So I, I found it the whole experience rather moving and felt quite honored to be a part of it. I, I owe that to Bob. Bob asked me to uh, to join the the crowd, which is also a a, a compliment in itself. And uh, and uh, uh, it was it was a, a really moving um, portrait that we were creating. Uh, and you know, again, I just you know it was a sort of an honor to help participate in that and hopefully tell the story in a way that moves other human beings. So, Thank you. And if I could just quickly say, uh, I had a once in a lifetime chance to get a private screening of this film in the theater and it's so emotional. And I, I just want to thank each of you for this film and the work that you did on it. it it's an amazing artistic, spiritual, and personal experience that you should all be incredibly proud of. Thank you. Thank you. We are. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Michael Bergeron with Screen Reflections. Uh, collectively, could I ask the uh, the everybody, was principal photography in one lump some or were things broken up because you mentioned the hurricane did that actually halt production uh did they, they have to rebuild sets it definitely interrupted our shooting i, I don't know if it, was it a month approximately a month for the shooting yeah and five also there was, and there was also the movement from one state to another state based upon uh decisions that were political and that was another break, but we didn't we didn't actually start the film, but we had to reignite it, find all new locations in Louisiana after leaving Georgia. So basically, it was one one large sum, one large piece, but uh, there was a break because obviously the weather and the amount of devastation that was caused to almost all of our landscapes that we were utilizing they're all destroyed it was it was center of the hurricane the uh, oak like trees the old, the old oak trees in at the evergreen plantation where we filmed <laughs> peter's were really um really damaged so they didn't come down but they were terribly damaged by the hurricane the only happy result of the hur hurricane in my view was the fact that the cotton that we had planted had a chance to bloom. And had there been no hurricane and no one month push, we would have been putting fake cotton, little cotton balls all over the cotton plants. <laughs> but nice. The, uh, the other lucky thing that happened, uh, I think because of the hurricanes, we found a new location for the um, sea battle area where um, Fassel gets killed. It was like, it, and it was literally probably a mile or two away from where the real battle took place. So it was sort of a lucky break. I think Bob found that. And we found that after the uh, after whatever we were considering shooting was probably ruined in the hurricane. So we actually found 
a what amounts to a great location and the real location uh, for that. So that was sort of a, if you one could say there was a happy accident, that was one of them. I remember seeing that Mississippi River for the first time and uh, going, oh my God, this is wonderful. And then when I found out it was literally, as you say, a mile away, it was very, uh, very impressive, quite beautiful. I guess I should some credit to Maria Berniak here, um, who was our location manager and who um, she found that river and a lot of other of the really good locations. She was uh, unstoppable. I'd like to give a shout out to Maria. Boris. Hello, Conrad. What can you tell us about your long collaboration with Anton Fuka and about your main challenge on this film? I'm sorry, what was the second uh, question? And your main challenge on this film. Ah. Well, hmm. I mean, Antoine and I have done remarkably seven films together, beginning with Training Day. Um, there were several years where we didn't work together. We were kind of going down different roads, but uh, um, I love working with him. He gives me an enormous amount of freedom editorially. The co communication is uh, wonderful and uh, very comfortable because uh, he's quite open and receptive if I decide to try something that he hadn't necessarily designed. He's very receptive. Um, he's also remarkably helpful when we get into the director cut mode and begin to shape the film. He will, uh, he comes up with some wonderful ideas that I never thought of. Uh, and it, it, it's a treat, you know, he's, he's so accepting of a, a good percentage of my work. Uh, and then we'll add icing on the cake, essentially, with something that I'd never considered. It, it just pushes the film into a better direction. Um, uh, he's just really lovely for me as a collaborator. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, what was the second question again? <laughs> And what was your main challenge on this film? Oh, the main challenge, yes. yes. Um, well, as I said before, I think it really was the second act, which is essentially when all the characters uh, make an escape from the railroad work camp and <clears throat> up, up to the time that Fassel is shot. That whole roughly second act area, because again, uh, it's absence of dialogue. There's no specific guidelines that I have to necessarily follow other than telling the story in the most interesting way. So it's very freeing because it's, uh, it's just visual. And, you know, what do I like? What do I want to see? What do I need to see next? You know, uh, and uh, it was challenging because of that. Uh, it, I'm not sure I'm communicating this well, but um, it it is more, as I said, documentary-like. It, it required the most experimentation and balance uh, editorially, more trial and error than other areas. So, um, but in spite of the difficult subject matter, uh, as, as an editor, absolutely wonderful to work on. Thank you very much. Mm. This question- Roman police. <laughs> this question is for anybody that wants to answer it. Um, given the nature of 
will going to these talk shows and being on the red carpet and talk, discussing this, the one thing he mentioned that I took, I took away from these interviews and so far is I don't want to take away from the people that made this movie, the people behind the scenes that made this movie that aren't me. And I really was like thrown aback by that because of that. Wow. He's really champion the people that made this movie. And to me, you all deserve being champion. Is there anybody that would like to comment on his comments and also how the actor is standing up for the people behind the scenes, which to me is fantastic. Well, I think we all certainly appreciate it immensely. Uh, we all know how much work was put in to uh, make this and how we all um, supported Antoine. Um, you know, I know the production end of things, I was spared, of course, being an editorial and distant from Louisiana, but Antoine had so many challenges on this film and that sad incident with Will at the Academy Awards was like, one more difficulty to overcome. Uh, so I know all of us certainly appreciate him acknowledging our work. Uh, he, he couldn't have been more lovely in my dealings with him, uh, which were primarily in post-production. I, I don't know. I, I only got to work with him a couple of times, but I, I got the impression of just from working with him on this film uh, primarily that his comment is how he really feels because he's appreciative every day of the, the and excited by like the shots that Antoine and Bob would would uh, would create and he would see playback of and, and all the contributions of everybody on the film, production design, costume and everything. So he was always, in my view, um, always on in the, everyone's corner, everybody uh, collaborating, producing the movie. So not terribly surprised that that's the comment he would make about this and not wanting whatever happened to, to diminish uh, the, the contribution he felt everybody made while we're making the movie, not just as a response or a nice thing to say afterwards, but as something that he, he feels you know, rather deeply and as a performer, you know, he's appreciative of what the art form of everybody else makes him look good uh, in the process. He's, he doesn't take it for granted. At least that's my impression. No, I agree with you totally, too. I think that Will's spirit is one of giving. He was remarkable to work with. Uh, he, he led us. He sat on the set in the most difficult of days and waited out. I mean, he didn't go trailer. It just, he, was, he was with us. We all we all appreciated it, and of course he continued that despite what took place. And uh, he's a true gentleman. I remember when we were shooting the pit scene where we threw the the older gentleman into the pit. He, like I think he offered them like something like five thousand dollars. Everybody who had now lay in that pit in the hot sun. So he appreciated even that work that the extras were doing and the other people were in it. So he's, he was always involved and always appreciative of the contribution and the difficulty of shooting this film, which was pretty difficult to shoot and in very difficult, uh, high heat and thunderstorm and lightning conditions that we that would interrupt shooting every so often. So it was, he was a very generous man, I have to say. I totally agree with everyone that Will Smith has got to be one of the kindest, warmest, just understanding people I've ever worked with and in front of the camera. And he was just a very gracious person. And hit and at times when he was just so appreciative of everyone's work. And for me, I think and and the type of character that this man was going through all these months, he is a human being first. And, it, and his acting and everything, okay, comes next. But he, is, he was so uh, professional and such a gracious person and who knows how that affected him later. But as far as a uh, 
working with all of us and and just working with him in the fittings and on the set and there was not one time that he did not have a a kind word for it for anyone and everyone so i feel that um he is just really a, a, the epitome of professionalism he is the epitome of of what it is to be a, um, a humble and gracious filmmaker. And I just feel very honored to work with him any day, any time, and to work with all of these wonderful filmmakers that are here now. And I'd like to say a comment to Bob Richardson. Bob Richardson, I do not care what color you are. <laughs> <laughs> to me, you had your vision and what you did on this film just brought it all to a reality that the entire world needs to know about and needs to see. And for as far as I'm concerned, you are an, an American artistic, incredible cinematographer that Antoine in his vision knew that he needed that hand in order to make this, uh, to bring this to the screen. And also Naomi's wonderful sets and, and Cindy and, and Ed, all of the collaboration, everyone, Rob. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, what your, your skin tone is, what your gender, what your age, it is about really having the compassion and knowing and seeing that something's wrong in this picture. There's something wrong when one human being has to brutalize another. And so in, in having that vision and having that scope, you really brought it, everyone brought it out and just brought it to a reality. And I commend everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to make it universal that Will, yes, incredibly gracious, in, incredibly gracious, beautiful to work with. I think whatever happened is feet of clay. We all have them. I'd like to add also. I'd like to add also that. Uh, being part of the mix, we're at the very end, and Will did come in for a playback. Uh, when we got everything basically there, it's 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 ninety five percent done, and and Will came in and was um, so appreciative. When the lights came up, he he loved what he had heard and seen, and it was very gratifying for us because we sort of took inspiration. The you know the slap aside, we. We took inspiration from what was on the screen, thanks to everybody here and what you had done, that we felt we needed to step up the sonic, uh, you know, what, what's compatible with that and, and meet that. And we had, a, it's such an important film. We had such a great time doing it. Will was appreciative and we're very appreciative of Will and what he did in his performance that we all felt we had to rise to that level. And uh, it was such a pleasure to meet him and to uh, get his feedback and to and to see how he responded to our work because we're all responding basically to his. All righty, thank you all so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your morning or evening. Thank you so much. Happy holidays, everyone. <laughs> Happy holidays. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.